My name is Damani Corbin, and I'm your host. If you're tuned in a little bit late, this is Get Up Stays and Mia. Uh, we, we're glad that you're tuned in with us. Uh, next up to the stage is Matt Jarvis from Sync. Take it away, Matt. Thanks, Damani. All right, let's get this show on the road. Uh, where are we? Okay. Uh, so this is me. Um, <clears throat> my name's Matt Jarvis. I'm a senior developer advocate at Sneak. Um, I've been uh, around open source software for a pretty long time, um, and I've worked in, in operations, in development, in DevOps, and, and now in security. So the, the story of the, the last decade or so in software development has really seen the boundaries of what's an application, what's operations, and what constitutes infrastructure uh, becoming increasingly blurred. Uh, the old view of the world was that the application was the only piece under the responsibility of the development team, and all these other elements of the stack sat under IT operations, um, with security usually a step right at the end of the deployment process. But the world we live in today is one where infrastructure and workloads are completely tied together. And to me, GitOps is really a, an expression of how intertwined these things now are. Um, everything's declared as code. Everything's a software development practice. And there's really no difference between our workload and the computing infrastructure that goes along with it. And by infrastructure, we don't just mean the underlying compute technology, but also the configuration and the, uh, the operational policies that control those capabilities. And as a community of practitioners, we've discussed in immense detail this blurring and consuming of the boundary between development and operations. But in lots of cases, we haven't really considered how that impacts on how we model and practice um, security. In many organizations, security is still considered to be um, an external practice uh, that somehow exists only when our applications are deployed and, uh, and operational. But this is really unworkable in this era of continuous integration and delivery. As we've seen, development-driven teams uh, now have responsibilities for most of our deployment stack. And so this gives those teams a much greater responsibility for ensuring uh, that those things are secure. By the time our code, our infrastructure is deployed to production, it's really too late to deal with the implications of security issues. And we can't slow down that development velocity um, to introduce security gates in the way that things used to work. Uh, because velocity and time to market is clearly the differentiator uh, for businesses to succeed. Uh, so that presents us with a set of unique challenges around security. Um, how do we make sure our applications and our infrastructure is secure? Um, when our working practices have evolved into these super fast uh, delivery pipelines. Security does still matter. And as we've seen repeatedly over the last few years, uh, security breaches can have a really massive impact on, on businesses, uh, both from a financial perspective in terms of uh, bottom line and potential fines, but also on how trusted our customers see us. And trust is really one of those key metrics for successful businesses um, in the cloud era. So first, let's take a look at the different classes of things we probably want to be looking at uh, to ensure that we've, that we've considered security properly within our workflows. And firstly, the applications that we're creating are workloads. And modern applications are usually composed of a relatively small core of homegrown code, uh, along with a huge amount of third party, usually open source modules. And that's great news for application development because the availability of modules means we get to develop applications faster, we write less code, we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time by solving the same problems over and over again. And anyone who develops in, in Java, in Python, in Node, in Go is going to recognize this pattern. And in all of those ecosystems, the number of vulnerabilities is growing. Now that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that code is getting more insecure. It can just be that there's more code being written and we're getting better at working out what's vulnerable. But in the end, this all means more opportunities for these vulnerabilities to, to be exploited. And 
any modules that we bring in can have a very large dependency tree, uh, both in terms of direct dependencies, but also indirect dependencies, dependencies of dependencies. So when we install a module, potentially we can bring in a ton of other modules uh, that, we're, that we really might not be that aware of at all. And as an example of that, here's a, an exploit from the Node community introduced into, into NPM in uh, uh, 2018. And uh, this is supposedly a library to parse HTTP headers, um, but it's actually a, a remote execution exploit um, to, uh, to process remote JavaScript code. And this was hidden behind a tree of other dependencies. And then eventually the direct dependency ended up in this mail parser um, uh, package, which has a huge amount of downloads every month. So it's pretty easy to see how in large developer communities, these kind of indirect dependencies can be used to hide um, exploitable code. So vulnerabilities in third party dependencies is super important because they make up such a large part of our code bases these days. But as we said earlier, the lines between our application and the container it runs in are becoming increasingly blurred. Uh, the container is the delivery mechanism for the application. They're typically developed at the same time by the same team. So for all intents and purposes, we can consider them to be uh, the same thing. And like the availability of library code, the huge growth in container registries has been great for the ability to run uh, prepackaged software super easily and for us to consume that in, in our own infrastructure. But they are also a source of vulnerabilities. Um, when we look at the container landscape, um, although best practices are emerging around things like building minimal containers, there's still a huge amount of people using containers uh, directly from the upstream repositories. And a lot of these can have significant amounts of vulnerabilities in them. So we're presented with a lot of possibilities for attack vectors and our developers uh, really need to, to understand that. And there's also a big long tail taking the path of least resistance by giving applications containers that are based on operating systems. Um, when we look at operating systems in general, the amount of vulnerabilities in, in base operating systems is, is pretty massively growing, um, partly because operating systems by design ship with a lot of software in them. Um, and because of this, you know, in some ways you can see these kind of operating system uh, containers as breaking the paradigm of of what we want to do with containers. Um, but there are still a lot of people using those kind of images for container deployments. And we can also see that this is the, uh, the sneak open source security um, survey from, from last year. And we can also see that many people don't think about um, emerging vulnerabilities once their workloads are in production. So an image that you use when you deployed that workload may now have vulnerabilities in it, which hadn't been discovered when that image was built. And if you're not looking at, at these things on an ongoing basis, then you're never going to find out that they're now um, vulnerable. And fixing these things isn't usually very hard. Um, something like 40% of, of Docker image vulnerabilities can usually be fixed by upgrading the base image. And uh, around 20% can be fixed just by rebuilding them. A lot of containers will run an upgrade during the build process. And the, the, the other place we want to be looking now is in um, configuration. And as we've moved wholesale into cloud and now into Kubernetes, configuration is almost entirely in code. And that's, again, part of our development workflows. And by configuration, we can include all of our Kubernetes YAML, our Helm charts, our automation, our Terraform, and all of the policies and configuration that goes along with that. And this is a massively growing field, as we can see from the amounts of this kind of code that it, it is, exists in GitHub now. And we really are only just starting to view that as something that we need to consider from a security perspective. But systems like Kubernetes are increasingly complex. And as we've moved the responsibilities for developing that kind of code into our development teams, there's clearly um, space for misunderstandings about how things work. And this is compounded by things like service meshes, which increase complexity um, even further. Um, and with that much code out there, we can also see the potential for taking this path of least resistance, where we might be using existing code as templates when we maybe don't fully understand how things work. And these are all 
uh, very important in, in the security of our environments. Um, this quote from the Urban Web Application Security Project uh, proves the point that a huge amount of security breaches are coming from misconfigurations in infrastructure. Um, as I'm sure most of us are aware, there are many, many real world examples of this, things like cloud credential leakages, uh, clusters infected with crypto miners. You don't need to look very far before you see um, examples of this. So where do we start in dealing with all of this in terms of workflows like GitOps? Well, the emerging answer is that we have to shift our security practices far to the left um, uh, and embed uh, security um, into our development pipelines and share that burden of security responsibility across our development and engineering teams. And this is where this idea of DevSecOps comes into play, that we need to integrate security considerations into our workflows in exactly the same way that we merged development and operations over the last few years. Uh, so where, where do we start? The obvious first place is at the developer and we need developers to have insights um, immediately into potential security issues and we need that tightly integrated into their workflow. And so that means tooling that's available from local command lines, um, things that are integrated into your IDE. We just need to reduce the overhead for developers to use these tools right at the point they're working before code um, even gets into our repositories. And the tooling we use also is to provide developers with the right information to be able to make security decisions. So not just lists of CVEs, but tools that give us insights into how severe vulnerabilities are, how exploitable they are, along with remediation advice. How do we fix it? And as we saw earlier, we want to be looking at all those things, third party dependencies, container images, infrastructure code, all of those things at this point. Um, you know, some of these examples here are, are doing this with Sneak. You can do this all with Sneak for free, um, but obviously other security tools are, are available. So our second touch point is, is clearly Git itself. Um, we've established that our Git repository is now the single source of truth for everything. So that has to be secure. Um, uh, Git has been pretty secure over the years. And in most cases, folks will be using hosted Git services like GitHub or GitLab for this. Um, and they've been very good at, at security, but there are definitely process related things to consider here. Um, by its nature, Git can open you up to certain things and our users need to be aware of those things and, and how, how not to fall into those traps. And that's things like enforcing two-factor authentication, uh, making sure our users understand uh, key security practices and that we're keeping Git updated locally. And exposing private data is always a risk, uh, particularly in um, uh, commit histories and stuff like that when we're working with importing repositories. Um, you know, configuration data uh, should never be in Git unencrypted, even in local repositories for exactly that reason. So this is really an education thing, uh, teaching our users how to use uh, things like Git ignore and, and, and making sure that, that we're not potentially leaking credentials. And it goes without saying that we need strong review processes. And this is really about the human aspect, making sure our processes are correct and that they're being followed. And where we can, you know, we want to enforce things here through automation, through things like, like pre-commit hooks. Now, once we're confident that that part of our, our pipeline is secure, we can start to leverage automation. You know, on every PR, we really want to be looking for the same issues that we were catching at that local development stage. But this time, you know, these things are going to be automated. So scanning our container images, scanning our code, scanning our infrastructure code every time something changes in this repository. And we also want to be monitoring for things that may have changed upstream since a particular piece of code was committed, even if um, our code hasn't necessarily changed. As I've said earlier, new vulnerabilities are discovered all the time. And code that didn't show vulnerabilities when it was first committed may now be vulnerable. So these monitoring scans over time will allow us to pick things up right in the code repository where it's relatively easy to fix. And our container registries also fall into this category. Nothing's fixed in stone. So an image that looked fine when it was built might now be vulnerable. Uh, if your registry has built-in scanning, which many of them do now, take advantage of it or use tools that integrate into your registries. And we need to be doing that scanning on an ongoing basis, even if we haven't changed our images. That base image may have new vulnerabilities. Images don't always get rebuilt unless they're actually getting changed. Another integration point is our CI CD system. 
Um, and again, here we want to be looking at, at automating all our scanning as part of that, uh, that continuous integration pipeline. Um, and this is a good point because we're rebuilding all of our code at this point, so we can catch things again that might have changed since it was first scanned. And the final place we want to be looking is our production environments. Um, containers in production, particularly if they don't, uh, they don't change very often, uh, can end up with vulnerable images. So we need to be looking both at running containers and as a double check at new containers being spawned. Um, in this space, we can also take advantage of, of admission controllers, things like Open Policy Agent, uh, to ensure that our security policies are being reflected in the code that's being deployed. That our images are secure and trusted, and we can actually stop things from hitting production if they fail those compliance checks. So the takeaways from all of this is that we need to shift that security left, empowering our developers to make decisions about security based on modern tooling and process. Um, in the world of GitOps, security teams can't be gatekeepers with control over deployment. Uh, we need to consider this role uh, to be changing, to be becoming um, advisors and toolsmiths as opposed to that, that gatekeeper role. And so we allow our development teams to deliver um, feature velocity and business value. And visibility and remediation for security issues needs to be baked into each stage of our development pipelines, leveraging automation, leveraging tools to scan that third party code, our container images, our infrastructure code. And that's uh, all from me. Um, I think we're, we're having Q&A later, so I'll uh, hand you back. Matt, thank you so much. That, that was a great talk. Um, and, and you'll be hanging out in the uh, in the Slack channel if folks have questions, right? Absolutely. Sounds good.